how many of you know anything about Docker or containers generally? All right, fairly good amount. Kubernetes? Not a one, maybe a waggle of a hand, but uh, okay. So Docker, of course, and containers generally were a really big theme last year at Astricon. And uh, Kubernetes has kind of come up over the past year. Technically, it's been 16 months since its first release, but uh, it's really new. So most of you probably haven't heard of it. Uh, and as we've seen, very few, if any, have actually used it. Um, but the whole concept of containers has made a huge impact on the way that we approach deployment in today's world. Uh, the whole concept of orchestration has moved from remote control type concepts, uh, chef and puppet, to active, responsive, dynamic, real-time live management systems, much as the keynote uh, uh, was talking about this morning. So you need containers in, in today's deployment world. Uh, we can think of uh, application deployments with the new uh, philosophies as multilithic things that are built on clusters of machines. We have a separation of concerns between the applications and the infrastructure to such a degree that we've never had before. And Kubernetes lends itself to this philosophy very nicely. Containers are their concepts in modern form have three main features. They are static, self-contained chunks of data that we can move around as a unit and contain everything that is needed to run that program or that application within the container. Most of you know that by now. Um, the other thing is the common distribution system. So Docker, for instance, has the Docker Hub. It has the same protocol that can be used for any number of other registries, and it's a very easy access to get everything else from it. Process isolation, you have a separate networking stack, you have a separate file system, you have a separate process tree, but it's all extremely lightweight and fast, nearly as lightweight uh, to to run a process in a container as it is to run natively, and is nearly as fast to start. Kubernetes uh, is one of the primary tools facilitating the migration in thought from machine-oriented semantics to cluster-oriented semantics. Everything in Kubernetes is designed to work against an application or specification for an application. You don't care about the machines underneath. You don't care about the storage underneath. You don't care about the networking underneath. You don't care about IPs. You can SSH into boxes, but the whole idea is you shouldn't have to touch a box. You shouldn't have to know anything about the box. Kubernetes allows this complete abstraction, and it builds this after being modeled on Google's own Borg system. The idea of running myriad con uh, containers across any number of uh, machines is critical to that, or the abstraction is critical to the ability to run that many containers. So Kubernetes does quite a number of things for us. It ties together each container into a unified network. It provides name-based abstractions. So you want to connect to asterisk, you say, connect me to asterisk. You don't have to connect to this IP or maybe these IPs and keep a separate list of what asterisk machines are running. You want to connect to a database. Just say, connect me to MySQL. This can be done by environment variables. It can be done by DNS. It can be done by querying the API servers. critical to a lot of other features in it, it maintains the state of each of your applications. It knows immediately whether, the app where the, whether any individual instance application is up, down, is in a failed state, is non-responsive, and it can take action 
to automatically restart, reschedule to move it to another box. If a box dies, it'll automatically reschedule it to another box. If an application it dies, it'll automatically restart it. And if an ap application goes non-responsive or has uh, clogging problems, it'll automatically restart or remove it. It provides configuration abstraction. This applies to both configuration and critically to secrets. When you're using Docker, when you're using containers, the last thing you want to do is store passwords or specific implementation uh, information inside that container that's redistributable and who knows what, where it might end up. And you certainly don't want to have to write multiple images just because you have multiple uh, data centers that you have different, slightly different configurations. Kubernetes supplies the tools for abstracting both those secret data and configuration data and providing this in ways that are very easily consumable for the applications themselves. Scaling applications. This is where Kubernetes uh, always shines and is one of the fancy features that everyone ever always shows, uh, shows off with Kubernetes. It's extremely easy to scale. If, anyone in, if any of you saw my uh, dangerous demo yesterday of what we were actually doing in scaling by dialing in the numbers is calling the Kubernetes API and simply changing the number of replicas that we are supposed to have running of any particular set, in this case, asterisk. We can also scale based on a number of conditions. For instance, among our asterisk containers, we want to scale up the number of asterisk boxes until the average CPU load gets down to below 50%. And it will simply start up 10 asterisk boxes if that's what it takes to get the load down. And finally, it manages storage. So this is a big deal for a lot of systems, slightly less so for asterisk in some sense, but uh, the idea here is if you want 30 gigs of storage, you simply define the application as running with a requirement of 30 gigs of storage. That's it. The underlying Kubernetes will find that storage and allocate the uh, either Elastic Block device or the Google uh, uh, volume or even a Ceph volume and place the volume with the container. If it's a local volume, it will place the container on the machine that has the local volume. The idea is, again, don't think about individual machines. Think about the cluster. So all of this makes Kubernetes perfect for asterisk, except for a few things, a few complications. So as everyone knows in asterisk, networking is always a huge problem. NAT kills things. And uh, any of these systems is almost certainly going to be built on NAT. Now, I should mention that it is certainly possible to uh, configure Kubernetes without NAT. Uh, but most facilities don't have the flexibility to do so. So you have RTP with lots of random ports. Kubernetes doesn't allow you to specify ranges of ports uh, to use. So you don't want to have to, have to specify 10,000, 20,000 ports uh, in a configuration file. Uh, SDP, of course, nothing fancy or new here. Uh, SIP, of course, nothing fancy new here. There's nothing special about Kubernetes that makes this any easier or more difficult, but these are all common problems that we all know. So two approaches uh, that we commonly uh, take here is host-based networking, which if you know Docker, you know is basically bypassing all of the containerization for the networking and allowing it to communicate directly. So while that's nice, you lose a lot of the abstractions that you gain from Kubernetes. So a better system is to use something like Camilio and RTP proxy, RTP engine, as, uh, as we've uh, seen various places. Um, but uh, in this way, you only have to expose the network on your border machines. All of the asterisk boxes and the demonstration uh, systems that uh, I was deploying here, even though we had discrete, as, uh, discrete virtualization instances, the asterisk boxes were not communicating to the outside world in any direct path. They were completely isolated and only allowed to communicate to the Camellio boxes and RTP proxy. So 
We have another problem with, uh, or difficulty, with uh, running asterisk in many VoIP uh, applications, and that is, in many cases, we have a whole bunch of compile time options that we have in our deployments. Just one package isn't made for all systems. One of the nice things about Docker, though, is it's very easy to define compilation options uh, into the Docker file. And we'll go through uh, the Docker file here. Uh, specifically, it's very easy to manipulate the menu select options from the command line in Docker, and we'll, we'll run through that as well. So file or uh, asterisk and camellia both have a problem of having very file-oriented logging. Uh, this is great when you're working with machine semantics and you're just storing logs onto that machine, but when you're dealing with a cluster, the last thing you want is a file to be stored locally inside some container somewhere, particularly when you have 50 copies of the same container running across the entire system. One of the critical things is to be able to get logs out, abstract them, and move them into, uh, say, a common system like an ELK log stack, Elasticsearch log stash uh, Kibana. Uh, but in any case, at least now, asterisk with 14 supports JSON logging, and it supports logging to the console. Uh, Camilio, with a, an unfortunately hidden flag, is able to run uh, in a non-forked version while still logging to uh, standard error, which will, in both cases, let us capture the logs, not store them inside the container to a file, and ship them out wherever we need them to go. Local storage requirements is the last one here. Uh, again, this is not really anything new to clustering asterisk, but uh, the methods of approaching it are slightly um, optimized in Kubernetes. We have recordings. The easiest and most optimal path here is to store recordings in temporary uh, locations and using a sweeper application to move them to a common storage. Temporary RAM-based storage and temporary disk-based storage is extremely easy to allocate in uh, Kubernetes. You can specify that you want temporary storage space mounted to this directory, and you're done. Uh, prompts. Asterisk 14 also now supports HTTP sourced uh, audio prompts. This is excellent. You can, of course, bind the standard prompts into your Docker file and hence your Docker image, but it's equally viable to have external prompts that you can easily update outside of your uh, distributions and outside of your containers that can now be referenced from within Asterisk. Other options here are you can have a on some platforms, you can have a read-only multi-use uh, volume, and other, uh, on anything, you can have config maps, which are the configuration abstractions to actually store files that asterisk can reference. Voicemail, always use a non-file-based backend. Database backend is, is ideal for this. So quick question here. Would uh, Camellio RTP proxy be containerized to or outside the work environment. So I will uh, be showing that here just now in the live demo, exactly uh, what we're doing for Camellio in such a deployment. And so, now it's the live demo. So this is the same code base that we have used, if I can get over here. Let's change this. To mirrored approach. All right. So I don't know how to use laptops, so you'll have to forgive me. All right, here we are. So can anyone read that or does it need a larger font size? Good, all right. 
So we'll attach to our TMUX session here. So as we can see here, we have a single application, a single asterisk, a single Camilio, and a single Nats instance. However, each of these are stored in, are, are defined in Camilio, Camilio, in Kubernetes as scalable deployment groups. So we can see here in the definition file that the number of replicas for each of these is one. If we want to increase uh, the number of application deployments to two, we simply change it to two and apply it. Now if we look back here, we've started another application. and We now have two application instances running. So this is all great. It's easy to do on the application side because there's no configuration that needs to be updated uh, on the VoIP side. It's all interconnected through NATs uh, using the ARI bridge. However, it becomes a lot more interesting when we have, say, more than one asterisk instance. So if we increase the number of asterisk replicas, we can see that our, uh, so I didn't show you the original dispatcher list, uh, Camellio's list of asterisk boxes, we originally only had a single, now that we've started the other one we've had two. Now the question is, how do we get there from here? Of course, uh, yeah, so we've created this new file, that doesn't mean communicate, uh, that uh, Camellio is going to use it. So we have very easily, if you look at the definitions here. Kubernetes is built on the concept of pods. So pods are groupings of a number of containers which work together to build, a, uh, build an application. So in our case of Camilio, we actually have several pieces. We have Camilio itself, we have an RTP proxy, to run all of the RTP. And then we have a dispatcher's program, which maintains that dispatcher's file and also notifies Camilio when the dispatcher's file has changed. So all of these are running within the same pod and all of these scale as a unit whenever you scale the number of aster as asterisk instance, whenever you scale the number of Camilio instances, whenever you scale the number of app instances. All of these hook in to the API, which is a plain HTTP API uh, from Kubernetes, which is by default, by the way, secure. Everything is certificate authenticated, everything is encrypted over HTTPS, and uh, even internal components can use this without having to store any passwords inside the containers. On the Camilio side, when we want to scale up the number of Camilio instances, asterisk has to know how to talk to the Camilio instances, how, what set of Camilio instances it needs to talk to. So the concept here is very similar. So let's scale up the number of Camilio instances. Ah, ah, I'm getting ahead of myself. So because Camelio is our border system. We want to be able to expose Camelio directly so that it can handle the dynamic RTP and the public IPs uh, assigned to the node. So in this case, Kubernetes exposes a type of deployment called a daemon set. So a daemon set runs one instance of this on any node that, is, that meets a selection criteria. So in our case, the selection criterion for the node selector is component Camilio. So any node that has 
the label component Camellio. Uh, so as you can see, we have four nodes here. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to read. There's a whole lot of uh, labels here, but if we look at one of these, I'm on it now, okay. Right under beta, component Camellio. Whoa, that's too many. So, Camellio is going to run on this. If we want Camellio to run on another one, we select the other one, we say label that node, which is 62, and the moment it's labeled, we now have another Camellio instance being created on it. This, create, this Camellio instance, once created, is immediately updated in the API, which is why we see it here in the list of pods. On the asterisk side of things, it's a very similar story to the Camellio side of things. We have some additional helper processes. We have asterisk, we have asterisk config, and we have the NATS gateway, which is the ARI to NATS uh, gateway. The interesting one here is asterisk config. Asterisk config does very much the same thing. It monitors the Kubernetes API, gets an immediate update whenever that list change, changes. So the API in Kubernetes is connection oriented, and so it's reactive. You get an immediate notification when anything changes if you are watching it. So this other, uh, I had canceled it, but you may have seen it earlier. Uh, the kubectl uh, get pods has the watch option. It's very much the same thing. You saw an immediate reaction whenever uh, the number of containers, the number of pods for any particular uh, installation changed. So this is how we bind these things together. Uh, let's take a look at some of the code to do that. So the asterisk config, this can be done in, in shell script. It doesn't have to be done in Go. I find Go to be simple and uh, easier to maintain. Or it could have no data in it. There. So we have a number of features here. We can simply watch the interface, which is what we're doing here. We're calling the endpoints watch. So we're watching all the endpoints in the namespace that we have deployed Camellio in this case. And when we get a change, we pull the updates. And then we send to asterisk the command to reload res pj sip after we've written out. I should, should probably show the writing out, but uh, that's this function here. We write out the config file, and then we tell asterisk via ARI to reload the pj sip module. So all of this happens instantaneously when uh, a new instance is running. So asterisk immediately knows that Camellio is, a new Camellio connection is up and available. So all of this is nice, but let's take a look at some of the other things we mentioned. So com compiling asterisk. This is always a huge deal. Uh, most of this file is boilerplate, but I want to point out this section here. This is where we can modify. Menu Select nicely exposes all of its options with CLI tags. So we can enable, in this case, the English extra sounds in GSM uh, format and disable the build native, which by the way is pretty much required if you are building a Docker module. You always want to, build, uh, to disable build native so that it can run on more than just the architecture you were building. And I want to disable Chan SIP because it's old and broken. And uh, then we just compile and execute. 
The other interesting thing here is the entry point. So because each asterisk instance is going to have a different IP, we need to build the transports for PJSIP based on that IP. So as part of the startup script for each of these containers, we build the transport based on the public and pi private IPs all that the uh, instance is running on. So when I'm scaling up and scaling down asterisk, I don't care about the IPs of the underlying orchestra, uh, or orchestra, uh, infrastructure. I only care that we can extract that data and use it. Kamaleo, uh, slightly different way of doing it, just to demonstrate the various methods. There's a uh, really excellent utility called ConfD. So if you don't want to build your uh, maintain, maintenance applications in Go or in a, in a real programming language, you can use simple utilities like ConfD to automatically build your configuration based on templates. So if we look at the templates here, we are actually building our Camellio config based on the IP addresses that we get for the instance that we're running. We bundle in a default config for everything else, including our routes, et cetera, that's static for whatever our deployment is. So the other piece of this is the code, the various code and uh, helper scripts and glue. All of this is available on GitHub at this repository. You are welcome to peruse it and uh, use it as baseline. All of the utilities, the little tools that uh, we've used in doing this is also open source and referenced in here. So uh, I've covered a lot of things broadly, but do, does anyone have any questions in specific? Would like to explore any of these options better? Any difficulties that they've en encountered that I haven't covered yet? I did ask this in the, the slide share thing, so you, you might have it there when you go ah, back. But um, yeah. I see you're, so you're hooking into the Kubernetes API to see that a new container has been spun up. Um, you're modifying the config dynamically to um, make that instance available. In between, there's inevitably going to be a delay and a possibility that the service within that container isn't actually available. Right. How are you yep. handling that? So in the definition, and, and I was trying to make these simpler, so I didn't include it, but built into Kubernetes, and I do have some examples, so let me uh, just go to a different code base. <clears throat> Please ignore the customer name. Oh, what do I want? Ah, no, I can just use an internal one. Never mind, that'll be much better. So I don't have to expose any potentially uh, <clears throat> not material that should be for public consumption. So, Let's use my own. So let's just look at my uh, <clears throat> invoicing web page. So in this one, we should have a definition in here called the liveness probe and the readiness probe. Oh, look, I don't want to display my credentials in there either. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, so, I guess we'll have to be changing those now. Uh, so, liveness probe and readiness probe are excellent for doing exactly that. So, a liveness probe uh, will have Kubernetes wait to announce the availability of uh, the container at all. Sorry, got it reversed. Readiness probe uh, will wait until uh, the readiness probe succeeds before announcing this, uh, this pod as being available, hence ready. Liveness probe is a maintenance probe, so it queries 
to make sure that it's still alive. So when I was talking earlier about uh, finding dead processes and restarting them, the liveness probe is for that. For starting a new application, because you frequently will have a delay, and since this one is running Meteor, it has a really long delay, uh, which is why we see, uh, let's see, four, 3,000 seconds, no? Yeah, three, oh, I don't have a delay set. So at any rate, we have a very long delay for a Meteor application before it comes alive, and so that's why we have a readiness probe here. So both of these are available. I didn't include those in the examples, um, but good point, I should have. If I can remember it, I'll add those. And there are various, no, uh, various types of readiness probes. Uh, an HTTP GET is an easy one, but you can also uh, use a number of different uh, plugins for that. Anyone else? One in the back. All right, how do you uh, compare Kubernetes to something like Swarm? Uh, how does that, uh, how, do they, how do they really differ? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'd l I, th I actually made a quorum, uh, Quora write up about that. Uh, let me see. Oh, if I could spell it. Oh, well. At any rate, if you look on Quora, I've got a write-up on that, and that's a question. But anyway, at its basic, uh, Swarm was initially built more like a config manager. So you define that you want this pod to run, or this Docker Compose, to use their nomenclature, to run on this set of machines, and go run it. And that was it. Didn't have any kind of state monitoring, anything like that. Uh, nowadays, it's gotten a little bit better. It has some state monitoring so that it makes sure it has, so it has a client that runs on the discrete instances and knows whether it's up or down and is able to restart it. But that's about the extent of it. There's no, uh, none of the API level access. There's none of the exposure of that state in any usable form. The networking is kind of left up to the wind. The uh, storage management, there's nothing. Uh, the, um, oh, let's see, what else? A uh, huge number of things uh, is very different. Now, they are trying very hard to catch up to Kubernetes, and that's certainly their goal is to be a viable competitor uh, to Kubernetes. And by the way, there are other players in this space. Kubernetes is by no means the only one. Uh, you have Mesos, uh, you have Apache's um, thing, which I can't remember. But anyway, there are several players. Uh, Kubernetes is both kind of the most advanced in many ways and also the newest. So they, they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, that said, Kubernetes is at a 1.4 release. It's very definitely ready to use. I have several production deployments of it and, uh, and it really makes things uh, easy. Yes. I Any other questions? You should have told me that before I went back to the front. <laughs> okay. I guess the other thing that is, uh, I notice you're using uh, EC2. I assume you're standing up individual instances and then Kubernetes is managing those. Does Kubernetes or have an ad adaptation to the uh, Amazon container service, or is that just on a, in its own uh, world? So Kubernetes itself doesn't work with, that, with ECS. Uh, so ECS is kind of a competing philosophy, competing manner. Um, I'm actually standing this up on CoreOS boxes on top of EC2. Uh, my own cluster is made up of bare metal systems uh, running CoreOS. Uh, the, the, the philosophies, the concepts, you can run the same thing on DigitalOcean, you can run the same thing on Google Cloud. Uh, ECS is far more, is not like Swarm, but it's far more of a, it's really a way to schedule, pa uh, schedule containers to be run, and that's about it. I've had 
various discussions, and I understand that Amazon's uh, ECS has gotten a lot more advanced recently, uh, basically due to consumer demand, uh, but a lot of that isn't documented yet, uh, from what I understand, and it, again, is, is no real comparison for me. But to answer the question more directly, there, no, there's no interconnect between ECS and uh, Kubernetes, except that you can use the ECS uh, registry, so the ECR, uh, Elastic Container Registry, from within Kubernetes. Yes? So Kubernetes, uh, I'm guessing your question was, what is the underlying uh, container technology of Kubernetes? Yeah, so Kubernetes uh, has for a long time been built on Docker. So everything it does underneath is, is under the hood is Docker. It now also, as of 1.4, uh, has support for Rocket uh, container engine. So there are abstract interfaces and it can plug to a number of different uh, container engine technologies. Up to this point, there are only those two, Docker and Rocket. All right, well thank you very much.